All right, so I'm Jerry Jacobs. I'm the owner of Elijon Coaching and founder of the, the shop. Uh, Mike Brown, who is coming, is now the owner of the shop, thank God, and also Tricycle. Um, so I own the coaching practice. Uh, my partner in coaching, Rick Sorensen, uh, national champion, a couple of hundred wins on the bike. Um, he is, I'm proud to have him as my coaching partner, very successful racer, very knowledgeable coach. We have Warren Dodd, who's uh, one of our elite athletes, had an awesome race season this year. Jaheim Williams, one of our youth athletes, unfortunately came down with this uh, viral infection. So he's a, he's a sophomore at Shippensburg right now, one of the athletes that I've coached and now a coach. I wish he could be here, but he is uh, down for the count with uh, this respiratory infection that's going around. And I do have Mike Brown. Uh, he should be coming down here and joining in the conversation. So let me fast forward and talk about what we're going to cover. Um, I'm going to take the first section in terms of how to pick a coach. Uh, what's the right way to pick a coach? Um, we are going to cover a sample calendar. Uh, just talk about a progression, you know, how much hard work you do, how much rest you do, how to sequence that. And if there's one thing that's really the whole ball game in coaching, it's that sequence. You know, how many days you can work hard, how hard you can work. Um, and if there's one thing I want to leave you with is that everybody thinks they get stronger by just pounding miles and riding more. And that is absolutely not the case. It's about training smart and about the progression of your workouts. So we're going to take you through some of our favorite workouts and a sample calendar and how we build a calendar. Uh, I'm going to have an interactive dialogue with uh, you know, elite athlete Warren. Uh, we're going to go over an actual race file, a race that he uh, excelled at this year. I'll give you the coach's perspective in terms of what the coach sees in this file, and then we'll get the athlete's perspective of what that race was actually like, whether I'm on track or not. And then we'll close with some of the common mistakes that we see that are really common to every level athlete. Uh, whether you're brand new on the bike or whether you've been uh, training for an elite race, you know, common mistakes are really the same. So we'll cover some of those. And again, questions, anytime you want to ask questions, let's keep it fun uh, and interesting. So a little bit about the slide. Um, this is Coach Rick up here. Uh, Coach Rick in that picture is 66 years old. Um, that's a 45 second lead um, in Masters Nationals. Um, funny story about this particular picture. I, I, I proudly took this picture. Not a particularly good photographer, but I'm proud of that picture. But when Rick and I reconned uh, this course in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, you can see he's a very good climber. And the steeper it gets, the better it is for him. Uh, me, I'm a good punchy climber, but really steep, not good for me. Uh, so we reconned this hill, and it got steeper and steeper and steeper. And Coach Jerry said, oh, this is not good. And Coach Rick said, this is good. And then it got <laughs> steeper, and Coach Jerry said, not good. And Rick is, this is really good. So he, his view was that I'm going to ride this hill really hard, where somebody's going to make me ride hard. And he went over the hill with a 45 second gap in Nationals. So that's definitely what we aspire to. So let me talk about picking a coach. First thing I want to talk about in picking a coach is a lot of good coaches out there. A lot of coaches that know how to build a calendar. So it's not about somebody has a secret calendar or a secret workout or a secret pattern. It's about who is going to listen to you. Who do you have a good relationship with? Um, it's about feedback and it's about the relationship in the coach and athlete. Any good coach that's experienced can build a calendar. So that's not the secret sauce. It's really, is the coach going to listen to you? Are you getting the feedback you want? And do you have a compatible philosophy? That's the way I would encourage anybody to pick a coach is work on those things. If you're getting those things, you're going to have a lot of success. And if you're not, you're not working with the right coach for you. So for example, you know, our coaching philosophy is about sustainable improvement. It's about training smart, but we want our racers racing well through the whole year, not kind of really fast progression and then crashing and not want to look at their bike in May. Right? So we're all about the right amount of work at the right time the right progression and having them race well and train well if they're you know, more recreational athletes year after year, month after month, but not rapid improvement and then a crash. So let's move forward. Uh, why do people hire us? So the number one thing I hear from our athletes 
is accountability. You know, I really wouldn't have done this today, but I knew you were going to look at it, and that is a big psychological factor. I, I do that myself. Coach Rick's building my calendar. There are definitely days when I wouldn't have done that, or I wouldn't have done it in the way that I did if it wasn't for having you know, that accountability. Uh, a lot of our athletes talk about validation. So even though I know exactly what to do today, it, for psychologically, it's just helpful to know this is what I should be doing today. I don't have to think about it. You know, my coach has this workout on the calendar. I'm going to go out and do that workout. And I just find that very helpful. And a lot of our athletes talk to us about validation. Feedback is huge. So we try to be really responsive. We try to get to athletes certainly within 48 hours. But if it's a critical workout, critical race, we try to give them uh, feedback as quickly as we can. Um, and it's about results. So, but results can be enjoying your bike, and they can also be winning a race. So we coach at every level from let me be healthier, let me lose a few pounds, to let me win a national championship. So let me talk about onboarding. So we tend to work with people for 30 days on just an introductory period where we try to listen a lot. You know, what does the athlete want to do? What are their time constraints? What are their issues do they have in their life? Where are they in their life? And if the training program isn't right for their situation and their motivation and their lifestyle, it's not gonna work. So the first thing we do is just a lot of a list listening. A lot of evaluating what have you done, what do you want to do, what's realistic for you to do in your training. Um, we prepare an initial calendar, and every calendar is different. I, I, I can tell you myself, I mean, we've had 25 athletes, I've never had the same exact onward. It depends on where you're coming from, what your goals are. Uh, they're common building blocks, but every calendar is a little different depending on you know, where that athlete is in their training and what they want to accomplish. Uh, we'll do some testing in terms of where their numbers are, you know, one, five, and 20 minutes. That help, that's very helpful to figure out where their strengths are, where their deficits are, and then we can really connect with the athletes in terms of where do you want to go uh, and where are you starting from and how are we going to get them. I'll stop there. Any, have I prompted any questions at this point that you want to ask? Okay. Um, we're going to take you through a sample calendar. So I'm going to have Rick cover about the next four slides. Um, maybe we can blow this up a little bit. Um, but I will tell you, this is, this is a calendar that would be typical as we're building a race or two race. Um, so the elements of this calendar are going to be very consistent. But the details are going to be very much different depending on the level of racer. So Rick, I'll, I'll have you take, take us through the next few slides. And then we're going to go into a race file and have a dialogue with our athlete of what we were trying to accomplish and how that went. Yeah, so first of all, the sample calendar, like where, where, where is this? Where does this come from? This is Training Peaks. Training Peaks software is what we use. It's very common, Hunter Allen. Um, that's his, uh, his group. He's the one who came up with all this and it's, it's kind of getting to be the industry standard for, for writing calendars and all the feedback and everything. It's just it's just a wonderful program. It just has it all built in there. And this is this is what we we start with. So we, a sample week would look like this. And then of course your whole your whole your whole month is going to have you know four weeks in there. So we can you know we can plan way ahead. You can put your your events in there. We can and then we build around those events. And it's all built around the calendar. But these are all these are all in Training Peaks. And anybody can go in and look at Training Peaks. And just kind of poke around and find out find out what it's like. It's just it probably is like I said. I think the industry standard um, training platform today. So it's uh, it's 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 a great tool. Um, so this is just a basic um, a week. I mean, what, what just just kind of a basic week that we would start with. Not this wouldn't be an early season week. This would be maybe even mid season. So um, Monday would be an off day. Now in this case, I don't. Most of our guys don't take in the middle of the season an off off day, but in this case it would be off. That would mean off the bike, just off the bike, which occasionally is a is a great thing. <laughs> just give yourself a break, get off your bike, uh, because a lot of guys really, a lot of riders do just overdo it. But in this case, off on Monday, and then we have a descending interval, which is a high intensity workout that we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, for that would be for Tuesday, um, and the one thing. If you, if you look at this calendar, you can see this is sort of our training philosophy. You're not going to see five hard days in a row. 
Okay, that just we just don't do that. I mean, well, there could there's a time when we may, we may do some overload things uh, to prepare for a stage race or something like that. But typically, this is one of the things you can look at your calendar and say, um, I'm not gonna I, I'm not I'm going to balance my workouts. So I'm gonna this is a big part of why coaching is important to get people to learn how to balance their recovery rides with their endurance rides, with their off days, with their high intensity days, because that really is the biggest, honestly, the biggest part of the puzzle. Because the, the worst thing that so many riders fall into is this, this trap of their form is bad, and they don't know whether they're overtrained or undertrained. And then, I mean, that's the worst place to be, because they don't know, do I need to ride more? Do I need to ride less? Well, a, a coach can really, really help you try to get out of that. And, he should, if he's a good coach, he should have made sure you didn't get to that point to start with. But we all have our ups and downs, and you know we have to dig our way out sometimes of, of training holes that we get into. But good coaching, that, that really is one of the major, major benefits of, of coaching, is being able to uh, teach you how to balance your workouts and keep you from the, from the real lows where you just get confused. You just don't know what to do. Calendar helps a lot of that. So we've got a hard, hard workout on Tuesday. Uh, what we call recovery flex, which is a recovery day. And the reason it says flex, we use the, the term flex a lot because um, I don't like to be, personally, I don't like to be really specific. Like if I'm gonna say your recovery day is, in this case is Wednesday, I, I'm not telling you to go ride 30 minutes. People are different. Coach Jerry likes to go ride an hour and a half on his recovery days. There's recovery days for me, I'm so pancaked 15 minutes that I'm good, okay? So recovery flex is all about you. You go out and ride as long as you can, spin your legs out just until they start to get a little bit of a flush and then you're done. That's all we want you to do on recovery. And if you wanna go out, it's a nice day and you wanna go out an hour and a half, go an hour and a half. If you wanna go 15 minutes or 30 minutes on your trainer, that's what that's all about. That's just, that's just recovery flex. You, you, the goal is to make sure you don't build any fatigue on your recovery days. That's, if you did, that's not a recovery day, okay? Because what happens is if you go out on your recovery day and you overdo it, then that, that's gonna impact the next day, which in this case is another hard workout. So if I went out and worked too hard on my recovery day and then the next day I, I'm only starting at 70, 80%, you can see how things start to go downhill. And again, that's where a balance and a good calendar will hopefully minimize or keep you away from those serious ups and downs. So, and a recovery day is, Knowing what to do on your recovery day is just as important as knowing what to do on those hard days. So again, it's, you know, you're sort of trying to teach a philosophy here of, of, of not overdoing it. And yeah, the recovery day is just as important as those hard days. Because if you, if you overdo it on recovery, your hard day is, is gonna be trouble. So anyway, another hard day on, uh, on Thursday. And so typically with a, a regular week, we're not gonna have more than two high intensity days a week. So we're gonna have two high intensity days, in this case, Tuesday, and Thursday, another recovery flex day on Friday. And again, let's say you rode an hour and a half on Tuesday out in the sun, it was a nice day. And then Friday, things are kind of busy and you don't have a lot of time, you go out and ride 20 minutes. I mean, that's, that's fine. Just flush your legs out, get a little bit of recovery. But it is important to be on your bike, I think, especially the day after a high intensity day, because your legs do need a little bit of a flush just to get some good recovery. Staying off your bike entirely, in other words, if Tuesday and Thursday would just sit off, and you sit on the couch, that is recovery, it's just not very good recovery for a bike rider. You know, if you, if you just really didn't have it in your heart to get on your bike, that's one thing. But your legs will benefit from just, just going out and spin them, spin them around a little bit until you start to get a little bit of a leg flush and you'll know when all of a sudden your legs get a little bit too tired and they're saying, okay, that's enough, that's enough. You know, but that's all biofeedback. You, know, you learn that by riding your bike almost every day. So Thursday would be a nice recovery day. Four hours of EN, that's just endurance. That means on Saturday, you're gonna go out and do a long endurance ride. And that's no high intensity, that's just steady tempo, low tempo. Um, you're just gonna build some endurance on that day. And then in this case, Sunday, uh, two and a half hours of unstructured easy riding. You can dial in some efforts there if you wanna do some Strava climbs. Kinda of depends on your feel, how you feel, how your week went. If you're kinda of beat up from the week, maybe it's only an hour and a half, maybe it's two hours, but you know, you just kind of work that in as you go. Again, that's almost kind of a flex day. If you feel good, you can go after some things. You don't, you're not gonna go out and hammer for two and a half, two and a half hours. Because the other good thing about a calendar is like, you wouldn't do that on Sunday, because all you gotta do is look to the next week and see the next Tuesday, you're doing another 
high intensity workout. Okay, well, I really need to dial this down today or Tuesday. I'm going to be in a tank. Okay, so that's so you know again the calendar helps you helps you work through all those things. So um, and it keeps track of your uh, all your numbers and your metrics and everything else. And we can you know that's that's a little bit more involved, but that way it helps us keep an eye on what your overall training load is, your training balance. <laughs> your fatigue levels and all those things because sometimes riders will really overdo it and their fatigue numbers get really high and training peaks keeps track of all that so we can we monitor what well, and it's not just us i mean the rider looks at this too he looks at all of his numbers we look at all of it and then we we go on to the next week and go from there so the weeks change every week they're never really the same depending on the time of year so if this was a mid-season one we typically work on three weeks on one week off so we're going to we're going to do a, three weeks of you know fairly structured heavy work, and then there's going to be a rest week, which is going to be probably 50% of the durations, some intensity, but a dial down week, so you can get recovered because you just can't go week after week after week after week because then again that puts you into an overtraining load, a hole, doesn't work. So, so that's what the sample week is all about. Should go forward. Come on. And then we're stuck. Wow. How and that's it. it. No. <laughs> um, Warren, do you know what's going on here? Why, why can't we advance that? I don't know. No. Okay. Here we go. There, there we go. go. All right, so I'm going to let Coach Jerry take this because this, this would have been the workout that what I would have, we would have done on the Tuesday. It's called Descending Intervals, and it's kind of one of our standard core workouts. It's short, but it's intense, and it does some very specific things, and it is truly one of his favorites. It so is. I'm going to let I can, Andre As an athlete, I can attest to how intense this is. This is the first workout that Jerry had me do um, once I came on as a coach athlete and it hurt. <laughs> yeah, and it's deceiving because if you look at it, see, you know, the, uh, the, the lower blue bars are light efforts recovery. And then every time you see the bar go up, well, that's, you're building some intensity. And, and if the bar goes up even higher, like those little three spikes, that's probably zone five stuff in there. So that's a light side. I think those are a minute as hard as you can go, basically. So, um, but I'll let him get into specifics. All right, so let's, uh, so, so Rick and I probably have, I'm gonna say 200 workouts in our files. And we're constantly building new and devious things to have the athletes work hard, but to keep it interesting, and to constantly having athletes progress. But of all the workouts that we have in our files, we have, well, about a half a dozen, I would say, they're really go-to workouts that almost all athletes will see these at some point and there's a specific reason for that and we will come back to that in many times over the season so this is one of my favorites um, and i'll tell you why uh, this is an athlete this is a workout that for a more recreational athlete that really hasn't done any training is going to push them but not so hard as to break them so it's a doable workout if you're a more elite athlete like warren it's going to hurt because it's going to really push the high end uh, the idea is to go harder and shorter each section. So we try to provide very clear descriptions of why are you doing this and what are you trying to accomplish. So the first part of this workout is we want a nice, complete warm-up. Warm-up is 50% of intensity. It's a lot of easy spinning and maybe a few pickups to get ready for this. The idea of this workout is three sets. Each interval is shorter and harder. So you're going two minutes. You're going pretty hard, not necessarily at the absolute maximum, but pretty hard. You're resting for two minutes at about 50%, then you're going one and a half minutes harder, resting for one and a half. One minute pretty much as hard as you can go with a good surge and then holding on to the end of that 60 seconds. One minute rest, and trust me, at that point, that minute is gonna feel like about 15 seconds because each interval is getting harder and then 30 seconds as hard as you can go. Just absolutely drill it, maximize that last 30 seconds. Um, and the reason is a lot of bike racing is I'm gonna go hard, I have a short period of recover, I'm gonna go hard again. And this is a workout that does an incredibly good job of testing that ability to accelerate on the bike, to recover quickly, and then to train your body and your brain to go hard again. Whatever level you are, that pays dividends. Whether it's a group ride and you end up with a tough section, or whether it's a race and you're trying to hang on to that lead group. So really, really productive workout. That's only about an hour and 10 minute workout. 
But as Warren says, you push this work out, you know, trust me, you know, your legs are going to be shaking at the end. Very, very productive workout. Very, very uh, rapid improvement in the high-end performance that you'll get on the bike. So that's one of the building blocks. Rick, I'll have you go forward and talk about another. Yes. Um, is this on a trainer or is this on the road? Either way. This is a, this is a workout that you can do either way. Okay, Rick. Uh, what happened? Uh, okay, there we are. It, either way. So it really doesn't matter. Um, it's a workout. I mean, I do this workout. Warren does it a lot of times on the MLK. Um, because this is, this is a perfect workout. If you only have an hour, only have an hour and ten. Incredibly productive. You could do it on flats. I mean, okay, you just need, you know, five minutes of straight road. And if you have to turn around yeah, during the rest, it, it's perfectly large, fine though. to do that, to turn around during the rest interval. I don't know why that's, no, no, it's going to sleep. Um, um, Jesus. I don't know why it's uh, doing that, but it's we perfectly. Like, we like variety It's of perfectly fine. That's my grandson. Um, but it's perfectly fine to do it on, uh, on flats. It's perfectly fine to do it on the trainer. Yeah, that partially gets in my I live in a really hilly area. Right. The problem I have with a lot of these workouts is it doesn't take into account A kills and B stop signs. Right. <clears throat> That's a really good point. And so with somebody like you that lives in a hilly area, I would actually build a lot of workouts to use your terrain. And one of the workouts that we didn't show you there, but it's a very common one that I put in files, I just call it Strava on structure, is go out and find a bunch of various hilly loops where the hills are varied. And they might be a two minute hill, they might be a six minute hill. Uh, but that is a natural interval workout. And what I tend to have athletes do in that workout is say, look, pick, first of all, different loops, because I don't want you doing the same loop each time, the same hill segments, right? I want you picking varied segments Pick out two or three sections where I want you pushing it quite hard, you know, maybe a nine on a scale of 10. And then ride the other four or five hills at maybe a six or a seven. You've had an awesome workout. You've done actually everything that that workout does, but you've just done it by using your terrain. So that's a really good way to do basically the same thing in terms of training your body to go hard and have a short period of rest, but you've done it using your terrain. So you can do it either way. There are lots of ways to get them. I was gonna ask, you, you mentioned, um go as fast as you can, or is there some parts you're actually talking about like recovery, is that based off of your FTP? Like would you, you have us do like an FTP test first? Yes. And then, yeah. Okay. Yeah, everything is based on FTP. So, and let me, let me stay on that because it's a great question. So, one thing I'll tell you about FTP is at least half the people that come to me don't have their FTP calculated correctly. And it's not they're bad people, it's just that they use, you know, the Garmin head units or other things that have a lot of error in the way that number is calculated. So it's on FTP, yes. Um, all our zones are calculated based on your threshold. But it also can be done on perceived effort. So we don't want you to become so focused on I have to be 122% of FTP. Even though that may be the way we built in the workout, it's not that specific. So if you go back to that descending interval workout, if you just say, okay, the two minute interval, I'm gonna go about an eight, you know, pretty hard, but not maximum. And then when you get down to those shorter intervals, I'm basically gonna go as hard as I can. I'm not even gonna look at the, at the watts on the computer. I'm just gonna say, how hard can I go for 60 seconds? You're gonna have a terrific workout and you're gonna get what that workout is trying to accomplish. In fact, for Warren or for me, I don't even look at the power meter for 30 seconds. It's just says, like drill it for 30 seconds and we look at it. We look at it after the fact as a diagnostic and we can see your progression, but you really shouldn't be, I gotta produce this number. Yeah, and that, that, you know, that dovetails real nice into this because the next workout is these three by 10 FTP builders. Of course, FTP, functional threshold power, right? That, all that is is how hard can you ride for an hour and sustain a power level for an hour? And we're gonna find that out with a power test. And so once we power test you um, and we establish a set of numbers for you, then they all go into training peaks. So every workout is customized to your FTP. So, and if we, and if you don't have, for instance, well, we have a new, I have a new athlete that has never power tested. So initially all of his workouts are perceived effort. It's like what Jerry was talking about. And then once we get him dialed in, but it's all built in. So it's not a, it's not a cookie cutter thing. So if your FTP is 180 or 380, it'll be reflected in the workout. So the levels will be set up for you, which is, which is great. Cause that, that's the way it should be. 
So if you want to train, if, if, if we're talking about that hour thing, well, you wouldn't want to, if I said, okay, if we need to figure out what you can do for an hour at FTP, so I want you to go out and do an hour at FTP, well, no one's going to do that, okay? No, they're going to run and hide. No one wants to do that. I don't want to do that, okay? So we're, gonna, we're just going to break it down into some blocks. We're going to start some blocks, and then we can build your FTP up with blocks. In this case, three by ten. So, you know, again, it's a, you know, once you look at these files, they start to, you start to see how, you know, they're, they're built fairly simply. I mean, they're just, there's not a lot to them as far as, I mean, once you see a workout file, which we'll look at in a minute, that's different. But the sample files, um, you just got to warm up, and then we're going to do three 10-minute FTP blocks. So you got to go 10 minutes at your FTP, which we've either established it, established it so you know what it is, or you've got your, perce uh, your perceived effort. And in this case, we're going to do three blocks. At, and, you know, when you, when you do 10 minutes and then you think about an hour, you appreciate the 10 minutes. <laughs> you really do. 10 minutes seems bad until you think about when we build it up next to them. Maybe it's, next one's 15. Maybe it's two 20s. Well, when you do a 20-minute FTP block, you really appreciate those 10-minute blocks, which seemed really long when you were doing them. But, you know, so it's all a progression thing. I'm going to build you up. I'm going to build you up as we go. And this is, this is a standard um, workout that's going to start to build up your FTP because that's, I mean, FTP is, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's basically what, it's, it's your engine. It's everybody's engine. And we just want to make sure your engine is up to its, up to its ability to whatever, you know, for whatever you want to do. So um, that would be the standard FTP workout. Um, and then the last one is just a long ride, you know, which was the other, the other ride that was on the schedule, which is an endurance ride. There are certain benefits that you get riding four and five hours or three to five hours, or two to four hours, because some people get intimidated when they say, go out and do a five hour ride, and like, that seems like, that's a long, it is a long time. But uh, anywhere from two to five hours, there are physical benefits that you get by just doing these steady endurance rides, and making sure they don't turn into a sprinting over hills and things like that, because that just turns it into a different workout. And that's not what we're doing on this day. It's all about what am I doing on this day? And this day, you're just going to build endurance. And this is just four hours. You're going to go out and you're going to ride light to, to medium tempo all day long. And that doesn't mean you don't ever get to stop or slow down, but you want to minimize that. But otherwise, that's all it is. You have to build endurance. You can't go out and just ride. Uh, you couldn't do descending intervals, and that's all you ever did. And you never rode over an hour and a half. And you, you'd have no endurance. Now, if your goal was uh, criterium, you wanted to win criteriums that are 45 minutes long, you could do that. You could do that. But most of us um, need a bigger endurance base than that. The way I always like to look at it is, and this has always been one of, I think, one of my keys to success. It was like, if I need to do, what, let's just take a number of five, well, I'm going to do six or seven. So that five I, is doable for me. Because if I only train four, and we, again, it's just a random, if I only train at some level of four, and I have to go race at five, well, I'm in trouble. I'm not going to be able to, to do five. So, you know, again, this is all about, am I gonna do a lot of four hour rides? Uh, typically, no, but when you do this kind of thing, it, it does, not only physiologically, it, it, it's really good for you, but mentally, you know you can go do it. If you're, gonna, if you're looking at a, a Fondo that's six hours long, maybe you don't need to go do a lot of six hour rides, but if you've ridden four or five, yeah, you can probably squeeze in that last hour, it'll be okay. But if all you ever ride is an hour and a half and you're looking at a six hour Fondo, Ooh, I'm not sure how that's going to work out, you know, and you're going to find out about halfway through it. So um, the other thing about, you know, Jerry said, I've won a lot of races, uh, you know, well, two things. First of all, you race long enough, you're bound to win a few. That's, 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 that's the way I look at it. But the other thing is, I've, I think, I think I've, I've never been satisfied with racing with just my peers. So when I was a four, I wanted to be a three. When I was a three, I wanted to be a two. When I was a two, I wanted to be a one because those guys were faster than me. Now, there's two things there you got to be really careful about. Racing with people that are faster than you will make you faster as long as you're not getting dropped and riding by yourself because then it defeats the purpose, right? But as long as you're constantly pushing yourself. When I was in the 50s, I tried to race a lot in the 40s. When I was in the 40s, I raced, or, you know, I raced with the 30s. So I was always trying to race with a faster group. Not one that was gonna destroy me, but one that was going to push me. And I always felt like that, that was one of the reasons I was always able to get up to higher levels. I was never really satisfied with where I was at. And that, that's just a mindset. 
but you can apply that to your workouts as well. You know, if you shortcut your workouts, you're not shortcutting me, you're not shortcutting anybody but yourself. So also, but the workouts aren't designed so that they're just gonna crush you. Not, any good coach is not going to try to crush his athletes because uh, who, who wants to pay money to get coached to do that? You go do that by yourself. So again, scheduling, it's all about balance. It's all about mixing the endurance rides with recovery rides in your high intensity and, uh, and making it all work in a package over a whole year. And that's, that can be kind of a puzzle. So. Okay, so we're gonna have a dialogue now with our athlete. And the way I hope this is interesting to you is I'll, I'll show you what the coach sees in the file and then we're going to talk to the athlete about what the athlete actually experienced in this file. Yeah, so, Jerry, I did, I did, excuse me, I just I wanted to drop one thing in here because I have a different perspective on this than, than he does because I came into the power game sort of late in my career. I raced 20 odd years. I've actually raced, I don't know, this is my 37th year of racing. So I think my first 20, 30, whatever, I, you know, you lose track at a certain point. But for a long time, and there was no, no power. We didn't have power meters. We didn't have any of that stuff. So I didn't, I didn't grow up, I grew up with no coaching and no power meters or anything. So it literally was sort of a learn as you go kind of thing. And I've only come into the whole power world in the last few years. Started racing on Zwift, which is where I initially learned, found out what my numbers actually were and how that all worked. But the point I'm trying to make is in Training Peaks, because this happened to me, when Coach Jerry first approached me about, well, maybe we should, you know, let's try some coaching. I looked at the power file like this and I was clueless. I was like, well, I don't know what this is. This is just a bunch of squiggly lines. And honestly, I just didn't know what can, what can I get from this? I just did not know what I could get from this. Well, now I know what I can get from this. And it's not nearly as complex as it looks. That's, and again, if you have a good coach, he's gonna help you work through that. And now Warren, as our coach athlete, can look at that file and he knows what that file is all about too. But we're gonna simplify it so it's a little easier for you guys to understand because there's some stuff that's in here. Again, Training Speaks has a, Training Peaks has a lot of information and some of it you don't, this don't really need like the temperature and odds So and we're, gonna, like we're gonna untangle that file. But because this is, this is rate, when you open up your Training Peaks, this is what you're gonna to wanna to see. Yeah. And you know, then I'm gonna take a lot of lines off of there. What's the minimum equipment that you're, you're looking at? Like for someone who's newish or? You know, like, he's not ready to invest in a power meter. Like, sure. Still so, so the first thing I will tell you is I can get you 95% of the way there without a power meter. Yeah. Okay, so there, there are a bunch of tricks that we can use. Any hill that you have that's a Strava section, as long as you enter in your equipment weight and your body weight correctly, I can tell exactly where you are on, on that hill. Um, power meters are getting very affordable, so they're down to a couple hundred bucks. But you don't need a power meter to start. And, and actually the power meter isn't even going to help us that much with coaching when, when you're at um, a beginning race level and you're just seeking improvement. But what's so important about that is you do the variation we're talking about. You do something short and variable. You do something to build your FTP and you do something long to build your base. As long as we're getting those pieces and we're moving those pieces around in a way that you can handle, you're gonna make a ton of progress. And then as you get more serious, then a power meter can be very helpful because then we can get from the general region very specific to where, where you are. Um, and there are a lot of things out of that power meter that are very helpful. You know, how rapidly you can progress. There are a lot of very technical things that are gonna be helpful. But as you start out, you don't need anything fancy. You need to create a varied calendar, you need to do enough intensity, you need to have enough rest in the middle, and you need to do enough volume. And if you have, if you have those pieces in the right sequence, you're gonna make progress, and then you can consider when you wanna get more serious. You know, when you wanna get more serious, when you wanna work with a coach, whether you wanna do it yourself, and whether you want to get more advanced in the equipment. But none of this requires sophisticated coaching. You suggest a heart rate monitor, like in that? Yes, I mean, heart, you know, heart rate monitor is, is a very good start, um, but I'll look at it this way, is that heart rates are tremendously far off what your actual intensity is. If it's 90 degrees or it's 50 degrees, if you're hydrated or not hydrated. So heart rate is very imprecise in terms of measuring effort. 
Let me give you a very specific example. This may be a little bit technical, but I think you can get the point. When you looked at that three times 10 minute um, threshold build, right? That is the most effective way to build your threshold, is 10 to 20 minute blocks where you're riding fairly hard and you're riding consistent. If you ride by heart rate and you do every interval at the same heart rate, what you're gonna notice is that your power is actually going down each heart rate. Technically, it's what's called cardiac drift. So as you start to dehydrate and you get more fatigued, your heart rate actually rises each interval at the same power. So if you're training by heart rate, you're actually training yourself to train slower each interval, which is exactly the opposite of what we want you doing. We want you finding that number where you can ride pretty hard, but not to the level that's gonna crush you, and riding a consistent number through each of those three intervals. So, but I'm not saying the heart rate isn't, it is, has some use, it's just that you know how to interpret it. Um, another thing that affects heart rate is caffeine, um, how much sleep you have, and how anxious you are. So I can be standing at the start of a race and be at 95 heart rate, my resting is 38. Right, tells me, I'm, I'm not even working at all, but it's, it's your anxiety. It tells you nothing about, at that point, about perceived effort. But it does tell you something, and we'll actually look at Warren's file, and go ahead. Um, winter time I work as a ski instructor, it takes up a lot of time. I can't even really seriously get on the bike until late March, and I do triathlon. Mm -hmm. uh, and I usually target July. Am I starting too late? to start a training program? You're not, but there, there are two or three pieces that I'll, I'll dive into. One is it depends on when your peak event is, right? So if your peak event is August, you know, you have plenty of time to go through a progression. Um, the second point I'd make is if you can do anything over that downtime when you're a ski instructor, yeah. it doesn't have to be that much because you're getting some, you're getting some cross training as a ski instructor. Yeah. So if you're doing even, I mean, I actually did some ski racing myself and I would, I would train five or six hours, you know, a week, not, you know, maybe a third of what I train in season. Uh, but that was enough with the other activities that when I started my race training, um, I was at a level that I could progress. So if you can do anything over those winter months, even if it's three workouts on a trainer, and you can do a little bit of what we were talking about that you should be doing over the winter months, that will greatly reduce the amount of detraining you get and it will make the, the launch point much more productive. But no, it's not too late. Uh, but the other thing I would tell you, I, I'm older myself, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm racing in the 65 plus next year. And, uh, and as you get older, you just need to be more consistent. So I wrote an article that's on our blog. We have, I'll invite you, all you guys to look at our blog. But it talks about as you get older, you can't ramp as fast. Uh, the younger guys can take bigger blocks of time off and they can ramp very quickly and get back into shape. We just can't. Um, so you have to be more consistent. Your progression has to be more gradual. And you just have to be more disciplined in the timing of how hard can I go when I go hard and how much I need to rest. If you're doing that, you're gonna get great results, but you don't have as much room for error, and neither do I, as a 25-year-old athlete. So we're gonna untangle this file. And we're gonna have a conversation with Warren, our athlete, and I'll, I'll spend a couple of minutes talking about this race. This race is Hill Towns. It's one of the classic New England races. It's a hard, hard race. Uh, the first thing you'll notice in that file, in the, uh, the profile, is it's got a big ass climb about an hour into the race. It's a three mile climb. It's called East Holly Road. It's one of the hardest climbs we do um, in New England racing. And it is one hard climb. 1,300 feet of elevation, it's pretty darn steep at the base, um, and it's a really hard climb. Where is that in New England? Uh, that is what, Northampton is where, where that race is? Northampton? Uh, is it? It's in the Berkshires, right? Yeah, I think so. So very hilly area, very, very difficult race. This is a kind of a classic race, and I don't know whether it's 40 or 50 years. I mean, Rick has won this race a number of times. Um, but it's a very difficult race. It's one circuit, it's one of the last uh, big single circuit races that we have left on a race calendar. So it's a hard race. Um, you'll notice in the profile that even after this big climb, yeah, just keep refreshing that, even after this big climb, there are a number of difficult sections after that. There are a number of sections that are three, five, seven minute sections. 
Um, so the way as a coach I diagnose this race is there are really three key parts of this race. One, can Warren make it over this big climb with the lead group? Because if there are 10 guys over the, that climb in the lead and he's not there, he's racing for 11th, right? So we need to train him for how much does he need power-wise to get over this lead climb with the group. Second part of this race is there are a number of very difficult three, five, seven minute sections. So does he have the stamina to still produce power even after this big climb, once he gets in that front group? And then the money is at the end, after all of that, in two hours and 25 minutes of racing, can he produce power at the end? Can he win the race? Um, so about three weeks before this race, before a taper before this race, um, I gave Warren a particularly inhumane block on his calendar. Um, <laughs> now, you want to win something big, you're going to have to work hard. But there are only so many weeks you can work hard. And that progression has to be something that the athlete can handle. And it has to be timed in the right way of the season. So we gave him some particularly difficult work to prepare him for having a high enough threshold um, to stay with this front group, and then having the stamina to produce these three and five minute sections. Go ahead. I guess this is where my ski background comes in. Warren would also need to have the technical skills to get down that hill before. Yeah, yeah, that's a cross your fingers descent because that, that, that is a, <laughs> that's a sketchy. It is. Even though I got repaved, and I think it's a lot better now, but it used to be really bad. There'd be bottles flying everywhere. Yeah. Also, just for, just for your information, that top line is heart rate, and the purple line is his power, and obviously the gray is the course profile. Right. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for advising that. So Rick and I, we'll, we'll have a little fun with this. So Rick's a great climber, and he wins a lot in climbing races. I do not win on the top of the mountain. So I try to win circuit races and long races, but... When it's steep like that, it's like, nah, not going to happen. Go ahead. Um, I'm a new cyclist uh, and still trying to figure all this out. But what type of cadence are you keeping um, for a race like that? And are you keeping the same cadence on, on those inclines as you would on the flat? So it's, it's a great question. So I'm, I'm going to get into that. Um, we actually have an article you know, on our blog site about cadence. And so I'll kind of sum up. Uh, Coach Rick's, you know, comments on cadence. Number one, cadence is tremendously specific to the athlete. So Warren's really talented. As you can see, he's not a big guy. Uh, he's a great climber. Um, low body fat, good climbers tend to work at higher cadences. You know, I tend to be more of a circuit racer, so I tend to work at a lower case. So the first thing is cadence is very specific to the athlete. Um, a lot of guys are racing at 90, 95 cadence, but that's not to say 90, 95 cadence is the right cadence for you. It's very specific to your body type uh, and the way you race. The second thing, it does vary tremendously. So if you're riding hard, you're in a breakaway, you're in a chase group, you're really, really going hard, that's where, where as a coach, I want to see your cadence higher. I want to see you really efficient. And if the cadence is higher, what it means is that you're going to be breathing pretty hard, but you're saving your legs. You're not mashing your big muscles. If the cadence is too low, you're putting lots and lots and lots of pressure on your quads. And over a race like this, you're going to get two hours into it and your quads are just done. Right? So we want to see the cadence up when the sections are going hard. Different on climbs. So three mile climb, you're going to tend to see 10 to 20 um, you know, RPMs lower. Um, we like athletes being able to spin their way up, particularly good climbers. Good climbers are going to spin at a higher cadence. So maybe 80, 85 is a great cadence on the climb. You'll see in that file, Warren's at above 90. So that's excellent, but you really have to train for that. You really have to train for that. You and I might be more 75, 80 as an efficient cadence. So it really varies on the athlete. All right, so as Rick talked about, the upper line is heart rate. The lower line is power. So you'll see the power is all over the place, right? Um, and that's one of the things about looking at power files. It's a very uneven power. So I'm going to comment on what I see in the file. So here's what we expected and the way we trained Warren for this race. We knew that this climb was going to be hard. And we knew there were going to be a lot of elite guys in the field and that this climb is very selective, meaning that it was going to blow this field apart. 
So we were guessing no more than 10 athletes make the front group after a three mile hard climb. And in fact, nine athletes went over the summit together and fortunately Warren made it and our other racer, Matt Meyer, made it. And that was our strategy is to stack the odds and put our two guys in the front of a small group. So that was our strategy. What I see in this climb, and this is a little bit hard to say, see, so I'm gonna interpret this. But Warren's heart rate is pretty high at the bottom. So these guys hit the base of the climb pretty hard as we expected. Uh, but you'll notice that uh, I know him very well. I, I've studied his files. I know where he can be. He was going hard, but he really wasn't maxed. You know, he had a little bit more on the top end. Um, and then his heart rate nicely kind of dips in the middle. So I know he's kind of in control um, and he's not really at the absolute top end of what he can be to make that front group. So now we'll go to the athlete and see how he felt. Am I on target or am I not? Yeah, I would say that interpretation is pretty accurate. I mean, we reconned this course a lot. Rick, I don't, I'm not sure if you've raced this race, Jerry. Okay, so they, they both know the course. They know typically how it plays out. And they told me on this climb, um, you know, do whatever it takes to stay with the front group because this is the decisive climb. This is where, you know, the race is decided. Um, and you can see, like, you kind of, after the descent, you come into this kind of technical, I think it's a right turn. Um, and they told me, like, you need to be positioned in the front 10 or so because as soon as you make that climb, people are going to sprint and hit that that first face of the climb that's really steep hard and there's going to be gaps open and people are going to drop off. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what happened is the first five minutes or so, it was really hard and just like that, like an instant selection was made of 10 of us. And then after like, you know, we'd kind of dropped all the dead weight because I think we started the race with 70 to 80 riders. Um, it kind of settled down and that's you see kind of that dip in the heart rate and the power drop is because like you know the group has been decided and now we're just kind of like pacing the rest of the way up the climb so, so just a couple of quick points here too number one is you can see in his heart rate once once he got over the climb i mean you see those dips that really is a sign of a fit athlete um when you're when you're coming down a descent or whatever, and say his heart rate was 190, maybe it's 120 at the bottom there. If you're not fit, it's 170 at the bottom. So in other words, you're always working. Yes. Is that your heart rate recovery time? Is that, I mean, you, you give yourself two minutes afterwards? I mean, the, the yeah. The, your yeah. fitness. Yeah, and we'll see that, yeah, we'll see that in your workout yeah. file, yeah. So it's say that when you back off, because you're fit, your heart, your heart rate Right. Uh, right, the that's fitter. Yeah. That is part of the that, that's exactly right. In fact, it's a perfect segue to the next section. Because yeah, so the, the next section you'll see has a lot of hard sections in it. So as we talk about, there are three basic parts of this race. Can Warren make the front group? He did. Then can he produce power in those next hour, hour and a half over these very tough three to seven minute climbs? And that's exactly what we look for, is how rapidly is this heart rate going down and can he continue to hit high peaks in the heart rate? That's the sign of a very highly trained athlete, is that it's not so much what their maximum power is, but can, can they do that 10 times, 15 times, 20 times? Can they go back to that? And so this is, again, a little busy, but you'll notice his heart rate peaks are very consistent. So he's not losing the ability to produce power. His power spikes and his heart rate spikes are very consistent, and that is the test of an athlete that's clearing that lactic acid during the race and is very fit because he can recover very quickly, so his heart rate is very responsive on the way down. And then as soon as you hit that heart section, his heart rate goes right back up and he's able to sustain a high level of power. And the power spikes, if you look at them, are very consistent. So he's able to go back up to a very high level of power even after two hours of racing. So again, we gave him a brutally hard block of work you know, to train for this race. But you know, mission accomplished in terms of the ability to recover quickly and then go back to producing power. And then after all of that, still to have power at the end. So that's the way I read it, is that to me, as, an, as a coach, looks like it was pretty hard, but I don't see any points where you were absolutely at your limit, where you said, I'm going to get dropped here. Mm -hmm. you know, so you were clearing lactic acid quickly, and you probably had one more 
kind of notch that you could produce if you needed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing that's really important here that we haven't really touched on is that any coach can have you go out and do descending intervals and three by tens and four by eights, whatever. Everybody knows that. All, I mean, most everybody knows that. But one of the things I think that we are very good at at Velojohn is it's one thing to train Warren and then just say, well, go race. I, I hope it goes well for you because your file looks good. We, we do pre-race planning, okay? We map out the course for them. We, we're gonna talk about tactics. That, that is a really, I think, one of the biggest parts of Velojohn coaching is that we're not just gonna send you out there with some numbers, we're gonna send you out there with numbers and an idea of what you're gonna do with those numbers. Because if you can't put those two things together, I've seen incredibly strong guys that just never, ever get a result. And it's because poor planning, they don't, they're not reading the race well, uh, you know, all those things that come in besides just watts. Watts is important, but if you don't know what to do with them, I think that's something that we, you know, it's never perfect, but I think, I think Warren would attest that's something we work hard at. I mean, Killington mm -hmm. Stage Race, Green Mountain Stage Race, Hill Towns, these guys not only I felt like were physically prepared, but I think mentally, you know, we had, we had written files to uh, preview the time trial at Green Mountain, to preview Stage 2 at Green Mountain, to preview stage three, to mirror that, those stages. So they're never gonna be exact. But I felt like, I, I like to feel like when our guys go to race, when I say guys, I mean anyone, it's any of our and athletes. Anyone. When they go race, they, they are as prepared as they're going to be. Doesn't mean they're going to win, but it means at the end of the day, they, sh they should have performed to the best of their abilities and didn't really get surprised. I always like to say, I don't like to, I don't like to get beat, but I really don't like to get surprised. Because if it gets surprised, it means I didn't do my homework. So. All right, Rick, let's sum up with uh, our common mistakes. We've covered a lot of these, um, but hopefully there are a couple of things we can leave you with, okay? A couple of cliches. So we like to train smart, not just hard. Doesn't mean that we're not going to push you at certain points, but it's a matter of where can we push you, how many weeks can we push you, and how much recovery is involved in the middle. So much better to train smart than train hard. It's all about variation in that calendar. You know, touching the short variable, doing the threshold work, doing the base work. And that combination will vary depending on the target event, depending on the level of athlete you are. Uh, more on the more recreational side, we would use much more terrain to create that variability. And then on the more elite side, yes, you're gonna have to do some structured work that is boring and necessary if you want to race at that level. But the package is all the same. Common mistakes. Number one by far that we see is not knowing how to rest. So isn't this interesting that if you look at Tour de France athletes, they're riding 50, 55% of their threshold on rest days, but yet recreational athletes ride 75%. 75% of your threshold on rest day isn't rest. Go ahead. When you're talking about rest days, can you just make a comment towards getting older? I'm 63, and I right. find that you know I used to, the things that I used to be able to do now, uh, you know, I have to I have to take time off. It's just, and something that you can, right. you can sort of get past when you're younger. You can make up for so much. Right. But there are times where I mean, if I ride hard four days in a row, I mean, I'm I'm just I'm I'm wiped out. And it's right. not I'm talking about riding. I'm just you know. I'm not, well, you're a young know, guy. Rick's 67. I'm 65. But, I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you think, what's the tendency, and I know right. that it's a younger crowd maybe, but just... No, no, I mean, but, but the, the patterns are the same. It's just the sequence and how hard is hard and the recovery times are different, right? So number one, for you or me at our age to ride four days hard in a row is a no-no, right. right? We can't recover from multiple back-to-back -back days. And what's happening is you're gonna be trapped in this being constantly fatigued, but never riding hard enough to actually improve. Um, I did write an article that I'll uh, direct you to on our, on our blog about aging athlete um, and, and the fact that you can ride very fast, you can get very fit, but you have to be much more careful about resting properly. So, so this number one is right. extra appropriate for you and for me, is that easy has to be below 60% of your threshold. It has to be at a level that you're not accumulating lactic acid. That's the technical part of it. It means it's what's called active recovery. It's, it is not a workout. It is allowing you to recover by flushing blood into your legs on your easy day. So 
So as Rick talked about, that might be 30, 30 minutes for you. But 30 minutes of very easy riding after you've ridden hard is going to be much more helpful than sitting on the couch that day, which is going to make the next day very difficult. So my hardest workout every week is the day after a rest day. I do take one day completely off the bike, and that next work day is brutal for me because my body is used to riding. Um, so you're better off understanding how to really rest, how to really sequence the rest, and how to make that 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 60 minutes of very easy pedaling. Uh, you know, Rick and I joke about this. We call that, you know, we want you to ride painfully slow on your easy day. So, you know, if, if someone on the bike path passes you with a lunchbox on the front of the box, bike, that's your riding at the right pace. That's recovery. It's very easy pedaling. That allows you to recover. You cannot do the harder work if your body is not ready to do the hard work. So point number two is especially important to older athletes. It's not optimizing your hard day. So you and I have to go hard on our hard days if we want to make any progress. Whatever level, you have to put in those harder days. And intensity is actually even more important for an older athlete because that's what we, we lose faster. We lose the intensity, the high end, before we lose anything else. We actually can maintain a big endurance space but the high-end spikes are what older athletes lose. So the intensity is actually even more important for an older athlete, but you need to time it correctly, and you need to rest enough so you can do it. So those two things in combination are really the holy grail. It's being ready to do the hard work and then making that, I'm gonna call it efficient, because it doesn't mean maximum. People get really confused about, I mean going hard enough to produce the improvement we're looking for, but it doesn't mean that you're in traction after that workout. It means kind of going eight, nine on a scale of 10, but not maximum. Okay, um, too much time spent in the medium zone. So we see that over and over and over and over. I mean, Warren certainly, I hope would say he was in that trap when I looked at his files before he came to us. A lot of two and a half and three hour rides that were pretty darn hard, but they were leaving him constantly fatigued, but not sharp. So I'll have you come. Yeah. yeah, just a quick anecdote. I had the opportunity to uh, race up in Vermont back in May, Killington Stage Race, with Jerry and a couple of our other um, athletes on the team. And it was a great experience. But after the race, it really, I like, it made me realize, like, I have a lot of room of improvement. And, um, you know, I wasn't, like, super satisfied with my coach. Like, I felt like a lot of kind of that high-end, super intense work, I just hadn't done it. I, I you know, when I, when it was time to race and that happened, I just couldn't hang. Um, and so I, you know, I talked to Jerry about this at the race and um, something that he said that was kind of like an epiphany for me. He said, you know, on your hard days, like you have to hit those numbers that you can expect in a race, which I mean, totally makes sense. Like, you know, you're not gonna go out, um, you know, train at a lower intensity and then sudden, suddenly on race day produce these like you know, amazing power numbers that you've never done before. Like, your, your body just can't do that, can't handle that. And, and as soon as Jerry said that, I was like, wow, like, you know, just a light bulb went off. Like, that totally makes sense. Yeah, there's two, two things there. First of all, we have a Velojohn race team, and we have Velojohn coaching. We have guys, at that point, Warren was on our race team, but wasn't a coached athlete. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be, it's not, it's not, a, it can be either or. I mean, or both. And now he's both, but... We have some guys, that, but at that point, yeah, he was on the race team, but wasn't a coached athlete, so um, he was able to see some holes in his game and figure out he needed to do some some things differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I talked about at the beginning. You know, I coached the Bicycle Coalition of Youth, the Philadelphia Youth Team, and and racing is racing. It's the same whether you're coaching a 15-year-old or a 65-year-old. I mean, racing is racing. It, the numbers are different, the sequencing is different, but racing is racing. And to Warren's point, you know, if you need 300 watts for five minutes in hill towns, which is what the kind of number that he needed to produce, and you're never training in that intensity, trust me, that will not show up on race day. There's no way your body can produce something that is never seen in the straight. So we actually want to train in a way that the race can actually feel, if anything, I won't call it easy because races are hard, but your, your mind and your body says, you know, I can do this. My, I can handle this number. So that's what we wanted Warren feeling halfway up that climb. That this is hard, but I have trained for this. I've trained for this, and I know I can produce this number on race day. 
I mean, that's the whole object of the sequencing that we gave him, is to produce the numbers that he needs to produce on race day. Not in the same length, but to break it down so that he could produce that. Go ahead. How, how do you, going back to that steep downhill, how did you train Warren for the technical skills so he wouldn't crash and kill himself? Well, he's, he's alive today, so he really <laughs> didn't kill himself. Um, you know, Warren, Warren has improved tremendously on the bike. So, I mean, I'll tell a little Warren story because he's here. You know, when we started together at the beginning of the season, I think it's fair to say that you felt a little intimidated on flats at a high speed. You know, he's an awesome climber, but he's a small guy. And his deficit, in relative terms, he's very fast, is that he's not the guy that's going to be punishing against 190 pound big guys that can produce power on the flats. So we want to minimize that deficit. We also want to minimize descending and technical skills, right? So we do a lot of cornering drills. We do a lot of uh, work on the bike. We do a lot of work as a team to get him to understand how to position into the corner, how to position out of the corner, how to look through the corner, eyes through the corner. So, and, and it's the same thing. You're not gonna go down a descent at 50 miles an hour if you never practice that. So, but we don't take you down the first descent at 50 miles an hour. We, like everything else, we're gonna break it down in smaller increments and then get you more and more comfortable for how to corner. Um, now, you know, Rick and I are different. The last time I raced that, I went off the front on the descent because I knew he would beat my ass on the climb. So I, would, I had a 30 second gap, and then of course all the climbers caught well, me if you have a ski on the climb. background too, that helps. Uh, ski, I mean, I'll tell you, I mean, I don't want to be long winded on this, but ski racing is exactly the same. A turn is a turn, whether it's a race car, a bike, or skis. You know, in ski racing, you need to set up high and wide highest possible entry into the corner, right? That's my gnosis. This is the way we trace criterion racing. I want you to set up for the highest possible entry line. I want you to wait to initiate the turn so that you create the apex at the proper point. It's what's technically called late apexing, right? Wait, 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 you're, you're a skier, and then turn. Then counter steer through the turn. That's a very technical explanation, but the point is that you need to do it. You need to do it in your training, and you need to work on it one piece at a time. So just like the fitness piece of it, the technical piece of it, you know, we work with you one piece at a time, never overwhelming you at any one point in time. But the technical skills are really important. Um, I mean, here's something, again, I don't want to get too long-winded, but I can show you files in Criterion Racing where, this, where athletes are next to each other at the finish. They've been in the same group and one athlete is riding 50 watts harder, like 20% harder than the other one, because one knows how to corner. And you would never believe how big that is in technical races. It can be 20% differences in power with guys that are riding in the same group for the entire race. But the difference is that the, that the more efficient racer is setting up high and wide for the corner, they are coming out of that corner ripping with speed, and then they're not even working for 20 or 30 seconds out of the corner. And if you're really good at that, you can save yourself an amazing amount of effort. Now, road race, not so much, right? Because there's one technical turn at the bottom of this descent, and then there's a three mile climb. So you're not gonna be able to get away with technical skills to get over that climb. You have to have just power weight on that. But technical skills are huge. Okay. Yeah. A couple quick things about that. First of all, descending is it's scary. It can be scary. It's scary for pros. There's pros that their Achilles heel is they are not good descenders. Guys that ride the tour get dropped on some descents. They're just not as good. And they're still going downhill fast. But the point is what we try to do and what any good coach tries to do is just give you some basics, just like Jerry's talking about. I'm going to give you some basics of how to do it, how to corner, hold your speed, relax your upper body. Um, I heard Nicholas Roach this year on the tour said something that, I mean, I, I, talking about epiphany, he rang in my ears when he said he was watching one of the guys in the tour was really having trouble on, you know, the, all those crazy descents they do. And he said, look how tight his arms are. Look how, look how tense his arms are. Bend your elbows and relax your arms. And I was like, huh, I'm not the greatest descender. And lo and behold, the next time I went out, I really made a point of relaxing my arms as I was doing so many sweeping corners. 
and it made a big difference. And I've been on my bike for over 30 years. Yep. So, you know, you, there are basic skills that may not make you the best ascender, but you can at least have the confidence to know that you're going to get through the corner in one piece. And again, I think a good coach should be able to tell you those things. Okay, so I think we've covered a lot of ground. So really all of these things more or less, you know, boil down to knowing when to go hard and how hard you can go, knowing how to rest enough so that you're really efficient on those hard days, and kind of the mix between those three things. If you're doing those things, uh -oh. you know, you're going to have uh -oh, success. You you're going to have a good training calendar and, <laughs> and you're going to improve. Jerry, um, your grandson's back on the uh, That's my grandson. I bought a bike for him today. He's, uh, <laughs> yes, he's uh, seven months old. So any, any other questions? Was this helpful to you guys? Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, give us some feedback because this is the first time we've done this particular presentation. So you want to be constructively critical. What would, what would you change? Because if we do this presentation again, I want to make sure that we're doing it in a way that is, number one, helpful for every level. So it's not just for elite racers. It's for you know, every level. And that it's um, hopefully enough information, not too much. So give us some feedback. Yeah, it's a perfect question. So, the, the, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you the last time I was looking for a coach, you know, let's, make, let's say 15 years ago before I became a coach. So one of the things I was really looking for that may be helpful to your question is I wanted to know, do you coach people like me? Do you coach masters that are trying to, to win a master's race? Do you have people that are winning master's races? Do you have that in your files? Do you know how to coach them? And then the second piece of that is that all coaches have their biases. So the coach that I was using, who was an excellent coach, he was an excellent coach, but just like what you said, he was more of a track criterion guy, and I was more of a long, you know, uh, road racer. So, you know, he helped me a ton, and I learned a ton from him. But the, way, the reason I eventually moved on is that reason, is that his bias was always you know, well, I need to get leaner. No, you need to produce more power. That's really a criterion racer. You can produce more power as a crit racer, but you want to get over East Holly Climb, you're not getting there by more power. You're getting there by power to weight. You've got to get lean. So you want a coach that knows how to coach the specialty that you're going to race. And I would say, I'm not criticizing any coach, but somebody that is a cross specialist and doesn't have experience in criterion racing is probably not a good match. You want somebody that does have criterion racing on their book. And you want somebody that has, and, and I'll tell you one thing that a coach really can add. So we have a really extensive file. We know, for instance, in any race, what numbers racers are at each level. That's something that if your coach doesn't have that, they're not going to know how to train you because they don't know what the numbers are in that particular race that you're going to need. They don't know what the target is. So that's one of the points of compatibility is do they coach athletes that are racing the type of event that you're racing? Do they have experience coaching that athlete? That's a really important part of the compatibility piece of it. So I would say, you, you know, if you want to be a crit specialist, you definitely want somebody that has experience racing crits and working with athletes that race crits. Because that is a very different ball game when it comes to the sequencing of training and the technical skills. Hey guys, before we go, um, velojohncoach.com. Not coaching, coach. Velojohncoach.com, all one word. Yeah, you can that all put that on our website. Phones. Yeah. Because there's a velojohn.com, which is the shop, which we are affiliated with but bellajohncoach.com, feel free to go there. Uh, it's a fairly new site, but there's a ton of information on there. 
that's uh, all of our coaching blogs, etc. So take yeah. a look at that, and you know anything anything on there that helps make you a better writer. If we're yeah, involved we would. Or not, uh, we encourage your feedback. That's a good thing. We'd absolutely love for all of you to get on your phone and punch in veladoncoach.com. Uh, you know, get us on Instagram. Uh, Mike Brown is sitting in the back of the room. Mike Brown is the owner of the shop, uh, both Tricycle and Velotron. So we encourage you to you know look at both sites. Uh, we are partners, so we want you to you know, hopefully support our coaching. We hope to put a lot of content on the coaching site. So there's a blog there; it covers a lot of the things we talked about. You know, we have an article on cadence, by the way, that hopefully will help you with your cadence question in terms of where you should be and how you should train it. Uh, we have an article on sequencing and tips for older athletes. Um, you know, Rick wins a lot of races, but I, I did win. Um, the Tap to Tour, which is the one race in America sponsored by the Tour, and just to give you a number for an older athlete, so 100 miles, and I rode 446, 7,000 feet of climbing. So you know you can ride fast you know, at 65 years old. Um, I actually rode with Alberto Contador for the first 40 miles or so. So I was up in the lead group, and it hurt. Um, but the thing about that race, just using all the things we talked about is you think, well, it's 100 miles, you win a 100 mile race by riding really long. The whole ball game in that race was handling three minute hills in the first half of that race. And it hurt a lot for me to stay in the, in the lead group on those three minute hills, but I got 50 miles up the road with the lead group. And then when I fell off the lead group, I was with a group of about 10, and I was 20 minutes ahead of the second fastest person in the 60 group. So a lot of that was having the ability to ride 25 miles an hour for the first half of that race. Um, so they're the perfect example of just pounding miles doesn't get you there. You know, you've got to produce the demands of that race. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I was going to ask, does uh, Velo John, do you guys have certified coaches as well too? Yes, yeah. Yeah, we have Rick certified, I'll be certified, I'm youth certified, and we have Justin Thomas as USC Cycling, yes. So, yeah. Thanks, yep. everybody, for coming out. Thank you for all the questions. Hopefully it was valuable to you. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>